All right, guys, welcome back or welcome to the Defining Endurance Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Andrew Simmons, and today my guest is Brian Metzler, writer of Kixology and one of the founding editors of Trail Runner Magazine. I'm bringing Brian on today so we can talk through a little bit of shoe history. I'm a huge shoe nerd. I love learning about shoes and technology. My background in engineering has me really excited because I actually spent a good bit of time learning about plastics and foams and all sorts of fun things. So bringing all of that together with something that I get to put on my feet and run and traipse around with is a, is a pretty fun thing to talk about. So Brian, I'm really excited to sit down with you today and kind of talk through a little history um, and, and really talk about kind of the movements we've seen in the past, as well as what's ahead of us in terms of shoe tech. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, have this conversation. It's one of my favorite subjects, of course, and uh, certainly always good to engage uh, with someone who knows uh, running shoes, but also certainly the, the science behind it. So when it comes down to it, um, you know, we have to think all the way back to, I think, the first thing that I can really think of, and maybe this is just, I didn't spend a lot of time learning about shoes. They don't teach that in school as much as they should. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I remember my dad talking to me about his first pair of shoes that he had that were running shoes when he was a runner back in Boston growing up, I believe was a pair of Adidas. Um, but then he's like, I remember the Nike waffle when it came out and the whole, you know, there was a huge ad campaign that kind of became behind that with blue ribbon sports originally. Um, can you give people just a little bit of like, when did we really start to consider running shoes, running shoes versus like a leather track spike, uh, and things like that? Like where, where did that shoe tech really, really jump off from? Yeah, I think I think if you think back to you know, um, it's not really thinking back, but I guess in the movie like Chariots of Fire, you get a good you get a good view of what what running shoes were back then. In the 1890s, they uh, in in the UK in London, they started making tracks track shoes specifically for running on cinder tracks because track and field became a thing, or you know, racing at various country fairs was a thing, and then then track and field became a thing, and so those were probably the first running shoes or specific to running, but really that existed, you know, a leather shoe with metal spikes um, existed through the fifties. It wasn't really until the material science uh, of, of, of rubber and of some nylons uh, started to appear in the, in the late fifties. And I think that, you know, there were some really kind of basic models of like Converse and Pro Keds were some of the originals in the early sixties. I think the first real running shoe as we know it today for training is probably the New Balance Trackster which is early 1960s. Um, and, you know, it, it didn't make a, a ton of headway. I mean, there weren't many people running back then. I think that the other piece of this equation is really kind of when the running boom happened, you know, when, when the first, you know, what they call the great American running boom happened in the seventies, which was, you know, maybe post Frank Shorter and some other things, you know, Frank Shorter's Olympic win in 72 and then his silver in 76. And, uh, you know, just televised Olympics in the first place. Um, it really kind of caught on. And then you had a demand for more people outside of the the very specific collegiate uh, or semi-professional track and field slash marathoning ranks, which was tiny back then. Um, but you had a demand for more consumer products and, and more of a need to make something that that uh, was built for that. And uh, so I think those things all kind of led to somewhere in the very late 60s or early 70s. And I, as you mentioned, Blue Ribbon Sports, uh, the, the precursor to Nike in you know the early 70s those things really set the stage for what was next and its whole explosion in in running shoes uh as a technology as as a commodity as you know pop culture yeah i think uh you know kind of doing a little bit of background research for this i was like oh we 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 can't not do this podcast and talk about run dmc for at least one second (laughs) and what they did for for shell toes and adidas and the three stripe movement there um but you know, that's, there's, there have been those pop culture moments. And I think, right. We think of like, even like Kanye West and Yeezys and all of that, that's, that's a whole different side of shoes. And I think Nike has done a a whole lot for that movement. When you think of sneakerheads and people that, um, you know, are, are looking at shoes as collector items. I, I would say that for anybody that's listening to this podcast, they're collector items, um, aren't, aren't going to be a pair of grateful dead, you know, Nike SB dunks. Uh, they're probably going to be their first pair of like, you know, they may have the original 4% or, uh, you know, an original Hoka or something like that. They're like, I'm going to kind of hold on to these because these are a pretty cool thing from a moment in time. And I think I want to bring everybody kind of up to speed for me um, of where I kind of entered this movement. And I originally started working at Gazelle Sports in Kalamazoo, Michigan, um, around the time that 
um, oh my goodness, the blank, the book is, is, it was, it is, it is absolutely blanking my mind right now. Um, but the book came out and everybody had kind of run into this, uh, this minimalist movement. And I I can't believe it's, Thank you. Goodness. Yeah. I can't believe I was forgetting that. I've, I've tried to push it far from my mind and I was, I guess, successful. Um, but that really ignited, I think, kind of a second wave of, of the running boom in a sense, but it wasn't all road-based. And I think that is really when I entered the, the community of running and started talking about shoes. That was the first place that I remember was educating their running store employees on Hey, this is a heel counter and this is, you know, this isn't just the tongue and the laces. We've got a heel counter, you know, we've got, you know, Hey, this is, we started talking about toe boxes and we started talking about, you know, fit. And one of the things that I think really changed the minimalist movement is that we stopped, you know, trying to talk about colors and meshes and things. And we started talking about this word feel. And I think when we started talking about feel, everything started changing because it, it, there was a big discussion about engagement with the ground and feeling the ground and this, this idea of connectedness. And I think, I think back to people like Anton uh, really kind of brought that to life. I can remember some of the, you know, new balance, early minimus videos. And it was just like, that is even, I think what drew even more people to Colorado was like this guy, this lifestyle, that, that is a place that I want to be. Um, and I just remember, that was where I had kind of entered the space. And so to kind of bring people up, that was 2006, 2007 from my memories of it when I entered it. And it feels like ever since then we have hit warp speed. Yeah. Yeah. That was a key time for sure. I mean, like, you know, I wrote my book that like, you know, the nineties were this weird kind of time that was, you know, everything was like flash over substance and like, you know, kind of weird colors and everything else. And there was some fluorescence and there were some purples with greens and everything else. But like, what there wasn't much of was making running shoes for performance. Right. And like, there's no surprise in the United States where a lot of the shoe industry was based, there was a really kind of a um, slowing down of like uh, performance running. Like uh, it became more about, you know, um, the bigger scene of the the kind of next generation of the running boom and people were doing, you know, things how they wanted to do them. And as a result, by the early two thousands, uh, we were getting a lot of shoes that were just kind of handed down from that generation of, of designers and such and what would sell the best, you know, and like certainly, Every brand wanted to sell more shoes. And at the same time, in the late 90s and early 2000s, running shoes became this, this uh, comfort shoe of, of Americans. You know, you, you'd start to go to airports and you'd see people, as you do now, wearing a pair of running shoes, whether they were a runner or not. But I think th- there's a key message in that, in that, that um, because running shoes were more than just running, uh, they, they, could, they had to be comfortable. So there was more, you know, thickness and padding and it didn't matter how heavy they were. And again, running shoe brands were designing shoes to sell in the mass market, right? And there's there's some good things to that, but it got away from what a real running shoe should be. And so by the early 2000s, there was this like, you know, notion that like, oh yeah, your, your typical trainers uh, for men say, you know, size nine could be like 13 or 14 ounces, which is crazy, you know? And uh, so, so there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of overlays. There was a, there was a lack of what we know now as modern, modern technologies for manufacturing and also materials. And, you know, there was a lot of like vinyls and leathers being used and they were super heavy. So by the early 2000s, as you kind of spoke about in the mid 2000s there, there was, a, there was this whole, you know, kind of reinvigoration of what running shoes should be. And it, and it had to do with the Nike free project happening. You know, Nike was trying to make lighter, more kind of natural moving shoes. You know, Newton was a company in Boulder that was like starting to understand like, oh, we can do something different than what everyone else is doing and not heel technology, but forefoot technology. Vibram five fingers came on and like, so we almost went from, you know, heavy, stodgy running shoes that look like, you know, what people call dad shoes now, which is, you know, kind of funny, but <clears throat> to, to really lightweight, minimal shoes that so kind of turned the corner immediately. And the other thing was, yeah, certainly born to run was a big thing, you know, trail running, people wanting to feel the trail more than like, you know, than they, than they had, because a lot of trail shoes were overbuilt too, in more of a hiking boot kind of manner. And I think also too, the internet just kind of spurred people to, to kind of seek out what they wanted and like just as WebMD changed the idea of going to a doctor or understanding, you know, diagnosis of certain things, uh, the internet allowed everyone to be a little bit of their own expert or a little bit of their own uh, inquisitive mind to find out what else was out there. And so, you know, certainly uh, internet chat rooms and discussions came up and, and certainly that all kind of was a big swirling storm that led to, yeah, this crazy minimalism boom, which 
you know, looking back now, it, it, it seems like it's in the rearview mirror, but I think we gained a lot of things from that boom as well. No kidding. I think I can remember back. My dad had a pair of like Nike Gore-Tex. They were like, like, oh gosh, like blue and lime green and like black. And he's like, can't wait to go take these out on like, you know, a wet run. And I just remember like within like six or seven runs, like they just started like breaking apart. And it's not a Nike thing. It was just, there was like this new materials and like, as you, like, as you said, like this thick shoes, like the dad shoe, like I think of my dad's running shoes. I couldn't put my feet in those now. Like I, not that I have some sort of princess feet, but like, <laughs> I think about what, what he ran in, in the, in the late nineties, what we did our first 5k in when I was a kid. Um, you know, it, we didn't go to a running store. Like that was such a, a thing that I, I think, you know, gazelle sports definitely existed, but it didn't exist even to my dad as a runner, like we got our shoes at like Kohl's, right? Like you went in, you got the shoes. And like, as a kid, like I was choosing solely based on color, right, right, <laughs> not on comfort. And I feel like that was a big part of the late nineties and things is like what was fashionable. And if you're running shoes, like it was more about like matching and looking good. And there wasn't tech in shoes yet. Like not, not from a standpoint that that was a selling point. It wasn't yet, um, you know, sometimes they say that the addition of something or the subtraction of something is a selling point. And it was really kind of crazy because it feels like that when we hit that point, when that minimalist culture started, it kind of like lit a match on a fuse. And that fuse was that that maximalist movement was also starting almost underneath it, right? Yep. At the same time, it's like we had these two divergent spectrums and um, I can remember the first time the manager of the store at Gazelle Sports, uh, he had gotten back from a conference. He's like, check out these hokas yep. that I've got. And they were the wildest looking thing I had ever seen. I think it was originally the Bondi, but I can't for the life of me. They were this audacious like orange and blue and white. And I remember they had like these black laces that had like almost like white inside them. I can't like even really describe it, but it's in my head. And I was just like, that that's the exact opposite of what, what you're trying to get us to sell, Rob. Like, I just remember like the, like the minimus 10, like V1, it was just like, it might as well have been a bike tire with an upper. Right. Right. Like that's how I remembered that shoe. And, and, everyone, and so yeah. like, <laughs> no, fired up. Everyone, everyone loved those. And like, yeah, because Anton was running in those and Anton was running 200 miles a week in those, it became a thing. And he became, you know, Anton Kapitsky became the first kind of, you know, modern running star uh, of the internet and social media when, you know, the first, you know, Facebook, you know, launched and then eventually Instagram and others. But I mean, like he became the star of all that. Right. And he won Leadville twice, back to back, Leadville 100 twice wearing those and, you know, wearing nothing but split shorts and like the whole world changed and everyone wanted to run, you know, with, with a very minimal shoe and then born to run all this stuff just blew up. And it was like, you're exactly right. It, it all blew up at the same time. And, um, but, but at the same time, you know, I remember, I remember around 2009 and like even being in, in Boston uh, for the marathon weekend and there was like, you know, the Harvard research team that had, had uh, done that report about how, yeah, we run more efficiently when we're, um, you know, Professor Lieberman, more efficiently when we're, when we're unshod, you know, barefoot or, you know, minimally shod. And okay, that's, that's true. And if anyone has ever run in track and field spikes, that's, that's also true. But, but it was kind of like this revelation to a consumer, uh, mass market consumer uh, public. And, and then there was this demand for this, right? And all of a sudden, every brand was pushing toward a minimalist shoe, and the brands that didn't react fast enough uh, were off the back, you know. And uh, Brooks took their time, and Asics took their time, and, and to their credit, New Balance went pretty deep in it. Um, but then, then, then we saw things with 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 uh, the other direction. So <clears throat> the Convara came out around that same time. The Convara was like the, yeah. for the first kind of low to the ground minimalist shoe with also foam, right? It felt good and it felt different. It felt light. It felt like a racing flat, but in a modern way, right? And then all of a sudden after that, it was Hoka. And I had known the guys that started Hoka for years, uh, kind of in the trail running and adventure racing industries and uh, in previous companies they were at. And I remember Nico Mermood came to Boulder and said, hey, Brian, you got to see this. And I'm like, okay. And I go down to the Boulder Running Company and the owner, uh, Johnny Halberstadt, had said, Brian, you know, I really believe in this technology. He and Mark Platchus, the two owners, and, uh, you know, they were um, seminal figures in the running shoe industry. And they said, yeah, this is this is really going to be a thing. And so I'm, I'm like skeptical because it looks like this giant cartoon shoe, my massive cartoon shoe, you know, but it was pretty light. And so Nico and I went for a run 
And I instantly got it the first time I ran. I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. It had this beautiful kind of rocker shape and it had this rolling kind of smooth kind of uh, gait pattern to it. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot of foam. But it felt, it felt, you know, like I said, fairly light. It was maybe 10 ounces, which was lighter than a lot of the previous training shoes I, I talked about a while ago. And it wasn't minimalist, but it kept some of the same minimalist qualities, meaning it, it used lightweight materials. It allowed your foot to move naturally. Um, and it kind of did everything that a lot of minimalist shoes were doing, but it had protection and cushioning, which, you know, most runners tend to like protection and cushioning. So, yeah. So, so we went from minimalism and hardcore minimalism to running, you know, really on the ground to boom, like this whole other thing with, wow, we can run with cushion and protection and foam and it's amazing. So yeah, it, it was a crazy, you know, hard right turn, but that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a, certainly a big point to where we are now. Yeah. I remember my first pair of Canvara's like, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is an amazing shoe because they had such a soft upper. Yep. And, you know, I remember my early days, even running that one of the things I didn't like and still don't really love is the kind of like it's an abrasive upper, you know, like I like to wear a thin sock with my shoes yep. and that the upper in, in a lot of early shoes, we had this mesh that was like a two layer mesh. And I can just remember like, you know, how uncomfortable, um, some of those early shoes were. And then it was like the Canvara came up and we started seeing more like, um, you know, plasticizing on like the edges of shoes. And we started seeing that, you know, they were embedding materials within other materials and that was what was getting it lighter and lighter and lighter. And it was like, it was this race to lightness. You know, I remember that everything that was um, in the in the shoe world was like, how light can we make this, right? And that's where the minimus was like, well, this is this is about as light as you can get. And so it was always this sacrifice. There was a sacrifice somewhere that if you had this maximalist huge shoe, well, it's heavy, right? And not as heavy as the dad shoes of the of three years prior, but, you know, we had these big, heavy shoes and I know you've got a couple props there, um, you know, that we can definitely dive into, but like that was, it was always about lighter, lighter, lighter. And I remember the, the, the Nike free even, and this was back when I remember, well, I can't not say the Nike shocks. I remember getting a pair of those myself, but I, I think back and it was like the tech changed from being a very mechanical thing right. to now it's all foam based right. and, or, nothing like the, the lack of any foam or a minimist minimal amount of foam was like, that is ideal. That is what we, that is, that's what we want. And it feels like within that time frame, by the time we hit about 2010, 10, 2012 ish, the two points started to kind of converge, um, where like the maximalist shoe was still absolutely there. And we still have the huge shoes. I have a pair of Nike invincibles behind me and that's still absolutely there. But then it felt like we found this like medium ground where like the Brooks Cascadia really came out and created something. As I remember, kind of one of the first trail shoes that was like the mix of both worlds. Like I felt like a low to the ground shoe with some foam that was designed to be run relatively long in. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, <clears throat> you know, like I said, Hoka, Hoka used some lighter materials, but even those original Hokas now are much more, much heavier than you probably want to run in right now. And the difference is, I mean, like what's really evolved since then in the situation you're describing is, uh, you know, material science changed so much, you know, and, um, you know, certainly there were so many new foams that came out and initially some of the foams, you know, e even the Canvara had a form of EVA, which is, you know, ethyl, ethyl vinyl acetate, which is a, you know, a form of a foam that's been around for a long time and shoes and it's still around, but, um, it was never, um, that durable. It would pack down and it, it never, you know, rebound. Um, so there's a lot of flaws to it, but what, what really kind of changed the world is when these new foams came out and the, fir the first kind of new foam, um, even though Hoka had, had used a new kind of form of, uh, of EVA was really, I think the boost foam that changed things. Um, yep. it was super springy, you know, and all of a sudden you can be cushioned, you know, in a shock absorbent, but also springy. And I think that, that really changed the game. Um, and, you know, and boost was the thing immediately, but it was also, you know, kind of heavy. So, um, you know, fast forward to today, now you have all these super light foams and every brand has one where they're both super uh, shock absorbent, but also super resilient. And, they, they, you know, um, we can get into the whole plate thing later, but like the foams themselves have changed so much. They're super light. They feel great underfoot. 
and they, they, they really, you know, they have long lasting um, resiliency. You know, they don't pack out, uh, you know, after, after a handful of runs, they, they stay with you. And so not only do they feel good, you know, running a, a long run, so say at mile 20 or 21 of a long run, um, over the course of, you know, if you're putting three or 400 miles of sh- uh, on, on your shoes, they still feel pretty good late in that, um, in that lifespan. And typically now the, the, the upper is going to wear out sooner than the, the midsole. Will. So, so the midsole foams were the next thing that really changed the game. Yeah. You know, I can think back to a pair of Canvara's like I would, you know, if I knew I had a long run and I was rotating pairs, I was like, I'm going to wear the newer ones for the long run. Cause they're going to get me through it. And for those that are kind of newer to the to the tech side of things, you know, I think about like foam kind of as a squish ball. So you guys will have to watch this on YouTube if you're if you're listening. But this idea of deformation is that when you have a um, a shoe, a pack out is when like you take something that had structure because most foams are blown, meaning that they're 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 heated up and then they're blown into some sort of last to fit a certain shape and. When foams are blown in, there's this certain amount of space that's created both intercellular into the foam. So they have cells and that as we, you know, pound with every single step that even inside a single run, they will pack down. And I think one of the biggest things is that we could talk all sorts about durometer and how all those things change. But the reality is, is we start to pack those things down. And then as we go into our next run or things like that, like there is a little bit of spring back. And I remember that was like, over time, you wouldn't get as much spring back after each and every single one. You'd eventually get to a point where your shoes are packed out, meaning you've actually displaced the foam underneath maybe the ball of the foot. Um, and so like there it's very, now, now you've created your minimalist shoe again, um, in, in a sense. Um, but one of the things that I feel like has really changed is not just the foam itself, but how we utilize where foam is in different densities throughout the shoe. It became not just EVA through the whole midsole of the shoe. It was now we've got, you know, a certain higher durometer. So something that's going to last a little longer in the forefoot, but then something nice and soft in the rear part of the shoe. And so I think to this shoe, and yes, this is a carbon plated shoe, but the foam that's up here is very dense, very hard. Whereas this back here is super, super soft. So that if I do land on my heel, it's a soft landing. But it's also now corrective. We've created rockers, which I think really started with the Hoka side of things yep. um, to create the rocker. And uh, again, another kind of shoe faux pas, because I'm going to try to mention as many of them as I can, was the old Skechers shape up. That was kind of the yep. the second, if you remember, that was a that shoe was all about the rocker um, and trying to get people to get onto the forefoot. And so now we've used technology and foams and different things to move our bodies in a more anatomically correct uh, way, right? The the optimal way. So we've taken this idea and said, okay, what's optimal? Now let's create tech that pushes people into that position. Because for those that don't really know shoes, and I'll be quick on this, is that shoes are also designed to how we pronate or supinate. And that also can control the foot so that we can correct some of those mechanical deficiencies that we have as runners. So we talk about shoe tech and there's so much that's happening underneath your feet in every single foot strike that there's no way that this couldn't have gotten to the point where it is now. Like we started, I started seeing more things like using words like posting and, you know, forefoot strike versus midfoot strike versus heel strike. It was, it's the controversy that still plagues us as coaches and, and running people today is that is the heel strike just as efficient as the forefoot strike. So I, I will kind of toss it back to you here, Brian, because I wanted to take a chance that there was there's some technology there that I know you've got in front of you that we can talk about foam. I know you've got a couple of old pairs in front of you as well as some new stuff. And I want you to be able to kind of share a couple of fun things if you've got them in yeah. front of you. Um, actually, most of these are, 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 are new foams, but I can talk about them in, in the last. And then when I switch back to you, I can get some of the older ones. But that being said, I think that... Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think the best thing that happened with this whole evolution of stuff is that we had new materials coming out that would give shoe designers um, or people that started with the concept of a shoe a better chance of creating a shoe meant for running, right? And so um, when I talked about earlier with, you know, when there was some, you know, EVA, of course, and then vinyl uh, and then leather, or all these things that were just slapping on shoes, um, it wasn't really giving uh, the shoe designer um, or a shoe brand the chance to make a performance-oriented shoe or even just a, a you know, 
a, a shoe meant for running, you know? And so I think, I think with all the stuff you just talked about, the best thing that happened was that shoes were then uh, made better to, with the intent of, of matching your natural foot movement and without getting into the p- political, like, you know, where your foot should land. I mean, just like, um, just the notion that like when you go out in a shoe and it's like, feels like, yeah, I can run in this. Right. Cause there was plenty of shoes in the early two thousands and late 1990s that, that you, you'd run in. I'm like, Oh, why am I running in this? Right. I mean, and, you know, I, th- I think that so understanding kind of the, you know, rocker technology, how a, <clears throat> how a shoe is arced uh, underneath, you know, to, to be able to kind of roll through things. Um, again, where, to your point, where they put foams, I think the, you know, dual density of foams, you know, one was cushioning, one was more kind of resilient or one was more kind of uh, comforting, you know, I mean, like there's, the, there, there's different understanding about how your foot hit the ground inside the shoe. Um, and then, yeah, with your natural inclination to roll inward or outward or be straight. Um, uh, you know, it, it allowed us to better understand along with kind of the moving forward of the science of running gait, you know, back in the seventies, everyone decided that, that pronation was bad. Okay. Well, most runners pronate because that's just the way your foot moves when it hits the ground, you know, ultimately to find stability, you need your big toe to hit the ground before you toe off. Right. And so if you're, if you're coming down on an angle and your heel hits the ground first or your midfoot doesn't really matter um, and you roll from the outside which is you know the lateral side of your foot you're going to have to go back toward uh the medial side because your big toe has to has to lever off right and that's that's common with everyone that's, that's that's the human foot movement okay it depends on kind of your own anatomy your own fitness a lot of things as to how that process actually happens but uh, for some people they roll extremely to the lateral side and supinate more for some people they they roll immediately and extremely to the inside, which is uh, the medial side, which is pronation. Um, and some people are a happy medium somewhere in between, but nobody's the same, right? And we're also different on our left and right side. The bottom line was that the new materials and new shoe designs helped us with the new science understand that, okay, pronation isn't a bad thing. And so getting away from things like motion control shoes or or severely like uh, stability shoes allowed people to kind of move more naturally in shoes. And I guess the long and the short of all that is materials helped a lot. You know, the ability to have lighter materials, the ability to have more flexible materials, uh, the types of foams, as you mentioned, um, and where they are in the shoes um, went a long way in, um, in helping people um, be less prescriptive about what shoes they were getting and more like um, running kind of naturally or, or the way their, their, their body normally did. Now, there's a whole different debate there and a whole layer of discussion you can talk about like you know how to how to um you know kind of manage somebody's uh movements of their foot if they are extreme one way or the other but but generally speaking i think you know shoes became more conducive to actually running and moving through the gait cycle um with less consideration about how we're trying to you know alter that you know and that, that's a good thing you know yeah i can think back to uh you know that shoe wear has also become more I guess uh, I'll use the word anatomical, if that's the the right sense of it, is that you you see some brands, and I think even you know early early things were like the uh, the sandals, right? They're just the those were the very early ones. It's like oh, we we want some very natural foot movement, but then even what I started seeing was more of an anatomical shape to a shoe that has the natural curve that our feet do. Um, and so, you know, now you see this in all shoes where it's right. It gets wider towards that. And we started really seeing an advancement, I think, into the idea of a wider set shoe. Um, yep, exactly. So whether that is like a Newton or a, an ultra and that toe box became, that was the new selling point was toe box, toe box, anatomical, anatomical. And you started seeing tongues on shoes that started following more of the natural curve of the foot versus a straight down shoe style. Um, and so, you know, this, even if you look now, if you compared an Endorphin Pro, which has a very straight, um, you know, lacing style versus, you know, the Nike, you can see that the distinct difference is that the Nike wants to follow more of the shape of the foot. I had a pair of Brooks. Oh man, they were like the minimalist. They were red on white. Um, was it the T5 racer? Oh, um, and that was like the first one that I remember that had that anatomical look to it. And I'm like, these just feel better. Like yeah. I'm not feeling like I have an aroma in the top of my foot. I can remember so many shoes that I had just with how my foot is built. That second eyelet yeah. would just drive my foot nuts. Yeah. 
Um, and once we got into the anatomical lacing, it was like, oh, this is, this is a, this is a big change. And that was really, really when we started seeing those small changes become. Now I feel like we've entered the phase of like the 2010s and even into the early like 2015, 2016 era, we started seeing, um, I think a slowdown, right? There was that huge, like big drill into the maximalist, the minimalist. And now we've kind of found this middle ground and foam was taking over everything. I remember my first pair of boots. I wore, I think I wore the added. Let's see. Adidas is naming conventions. Drive me bananas. Right. The Adidas Add a Zero Boston Boost, yeah. like four, five, six, and seven. I wore those probably the, that three series. I probably have ten pairs in the garage, um, and they just didn't wear out. I could put seven, eight hundred, nine hundred miles in those shoes, and I'd be wearing the Continental rubber away right. before anything else. Right. Right. Yeah, it, it is amazing. And like I think that you know we mentioned Ultra briefly, and I think that you know Ultra is another brand that came out around twenty eleven or so. And what Ultra brought to the table was, you know, two things that, that still stick with them. And one is the, the wider toe box, um, more of a foot shaped mm -hmm. toe box. And then they also they also had a, a kind of a zero drop platform, which Newton kind of also had a very low drop platform as well. Back in the day, you know, prior to the, the minimalist movement, most shoes were built on like a 12 millimeter heel uh, to four foot slope. Right. And, and everyone just took it for granted. It was 12 to 14. And, 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 and that's what every shoe was. And then all of a sudden, when these shoes were coming out with, you know, flatter, kind of more balanced, more level um, cushioning, all of a sudden it became a thing, right? And then we realized, okay, yeah. maybe we don't need that huge heel lift, you know? And like, and now because of um, what some of those brands did, Ultra and Newton specifically, the Nike Free, um, it, it came to a point where, yeah, we don't need maybe 12 or 14, maybe it's, you know, eight, maybe it's six, right? And so it, that also yeah. changed, you know, um, our ability to run and run more smoothly and run more kind of, you know, how our bodies would normally run. Right. And then mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, wherever you fall on that spectrum, I think the wide toe box has definitely been a, a good thing for a lot of people. I think certainly, uh, ultra was the brand that really kind of pushed it. A lot of brands have come you know, to that as well. And I think that, you know, if you remember, you know, you know, I, I, I ran track and field when I was younger. And so, um, track spikes were always super tight, almost like a half size too small, right? That's, that's just what you felt. Mm -hmm. And that's almost what you needed, I guess, in the days of prehistoric track spikes. But but as shoes evolved, like I remember like racing up, lacing up road shoes around, you know, maybe the year 2000 and like uh, thinking, why are my feet so cramped? You know, that's, they're just built to be narrow, you know? And, and yeah. especially as trail running shoes evolved, you definitely didn't want a tight cramped toe box in those because like, Anything you hit in the trail, and you're always hitting stuff on the trail, but if you hit anything like even stub your toe slightly on the trail, it was like a major deal. Like, oh my God, that hurts. It's like, you know, it's like walking through your bedroom when you hit your pinky toe on the bed frame. It's like, ah, that would happen trail running. And I think that certainly a wider toe box, which Ultra put into its trail shoes right away and, and, and other brands followed, and that, that came into road running more. And so now we don't see that like really kind of compact as much. There's still some out there, but um, I think that was a big innovation as well. And like, you know, you could look down at your foot and look down at your shoe and they, you know, they weren't the same shape. And like, you know, like, how does my foot fit in that? Right. And so now I think that like, um, like here's the new balance, uh, 1080, uh, B13. And like, this is the, one of the new ultra, this is the new ultra, uh, uh, the carbon fiber shoe, but like, um, more shoes have a more accommodating forefoot. And I think that, you know, what, what ultra will say, and a lot of the uh, sports scientists will say is it'll give you more of a chance for your toes to display out and, you know, get full, functionality of of that forefoot flexing uh, dorsiflexion and kind of uh, you know kind of toe off phase into the next stride and so again that's a whole scientific thing which we could go into or go down the road in but i think the the thing that most runners realize is that it feels a little bit better you're not you're, your toes aren't just all crammed in there so i think that was a huge uh, huge thing as well and um certainly you know as these some of these innovations have come out either foams or kind of drops or, um, you know, forefoot widths. I mean, like a lot of brands kind of take and borrow and make their own their own way with them. But I think, you know, over the long course of the last 10 years, wow, we've really seen a lot of um, great things come out. And now there's so many better running shoes because of it. Yeah, I I completely glossed over that whole zero drop movement because in my mind it was it was kind of hand in hand with the minimalist movement, but it's it isn't, right? You know, I, I, I think... Um, I think that was really how we learned that you can't just go from that 12, 14 shoe to a zero drop shoe and just, I'm the, this is the way I'm going now. Right. You know, I think, 
uh, a lot of podiatrists and a lot of uh, a lot of doctors. Uh, we all got to learn about a muscle called the soleus yeah. um, <laughs> because of it, um, and our Achilles. And you know how how flexible is it? How dur- how well can things like this uh, move? And you have to. And I'll say this just to be said on the podcast is you have to work your way into those shoes. You know, I think that is what we're also seeing. I think long-term, I'd love to see a study of the long-term impacts of foam um, and all those things on um, how we, how we train and how we run, you know, more and more, right. I coach a lot of youth athletes and more and more, I've got kids that are in, in these types of shoes, but at the very same time, when I have my athletes get into the gym and, you know, like, I'm like, guys, take your shoes off. You don't need to lift. You need to feel the ground. Like there are certain times and places where I do want barefoot strides and things like that because they do need to have a sense and understanding of that feel that is important. And so some of these things have gotten, I, I think, in some some wild directions. And I think we can move into kind of the the new, um, I guess, the the new level of things is you know, we really had like the Nike 4%, the Alpha Fly come in. We started to see carbon, carbon plated shoes. And what happened in my mind is that stiffness, right? We moved away from being able to feel the ground to now we've created stiffness. We've created torque. We've created things like levers. And now it's, it's cushioning in a, in a completely different way. How can we make this a mechanical tool to our advantage so that we can actually you know, run faster. And I think one of the things that was really interesting as part of a conference that coach Simmons down in Colorado Springs put on this year, he said, there's two reasons to buy, you know, these new super shoes, if I can call them that is it's not just the mechanical advantage that we get. It's also the fact that we're not getting as beat up from our interaction with the ground, right? There is a mechanical lever in here that takes a little bit out that 4%, 5% or more, depending on if you're an a, adapter um, to an, a, and can get advantage out of these shoes is that you're actually able to get more mileage in. If you're in a shoe like this, you're able to get more reps, which means you get more of a cardiovascular, right? Stimulus for longer because you're in a shoe. which I think has completely changed the game in terms of what are the limits of, you know, we used to say, Oh, this is the volume I'm doing for my workout. Now I've got a pair of shoes where my legs aren't tired. So I can push my lungs a little bit further. And so I think the one question I wanted to kind of answer in this next little phase here or towards the end is, do we feel like the carbon fiber plates that have been added into shoes is the benefit distinctly from the shoe itself? Or is it from a coaching perspective that now we can get an aerobic benefit, right? We were able to train more. And so, you know, that's, we can, we can get our way there, but it's an interesting place to see is that, is this just a mechanical thing or is this also a function that training has also leveled up at the same time? Yeah, I think you'd make a really good point there. And I think the first time I, I wore a pair of Nike 4%, I, you know, I, I, I remember I got them, I was all excited to get them and like, okay, see what this is all about. I remember the first day I ran them, I ran fairly fast. I remember did a seven mile like downhill tempo run. It was just flying and everything else. And it felt like I was on these springs um, or levers and, and okay, I got that right away. And then like two days later, I ran a 16 mile run. And the beauty of that was certainly I felt light and, and kind of lively and everything else in my stride. And so the 16 miles went by well. Um, but the, the thing I really noticed was recovery. The next day I didn't feel sore. I didn't feel tired. I didn't feel fatigued. Normally if you go on a 16 to 20 mile run and need a pair of shoes, yeah, you'll feel that. Right. And like the reason we take a day off or an easy day or recovery day on, you know, say a Monday after a long run before we do a harder workout is because, yeah, we, we need to, to not be so fatigued. And like that was a huge revel- revelation to me. And I remember talking even to, to Kenyon Newman, uh, who is at Nike and, and, you know, at the formulation of this, uh, this 4% project, he was saying, yeah, he's like, the recovery is so you know ridiculous. And, 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 and yeah. And so to your point, yeah, you can do longer workouts. You can do longer interval sessions. You can do harder interval sessions. You can do, you know, things like uh, 30K tempo runs or extended, extended, you know, marathon effort things in training and not pay the price for it. You know, I think that, it, you know, th- there's been people trying to push the envelope of that before, but only with the shoes have they allowed to really get the training benefit of it because a 30K tempo or 30K, what do you want to call it, extended marathon pace run can be pretty, pretty debilitating, right? For most runners, but especially, yeah. you know, even for elite runners. 
But I think when you're recovering well or not feeling the impacts of that as much because of the shoes, you're really, really getting the benefits of that. So, yeah, I think I think the, the shoes have helped change the game. I and mean, we see the faster times. We saw the the breaking two project. We know the world records have gone down from a pure speed point of view. True, but it's so much more than a pure speed point of view. Everyone's training better, more efficiently, more effectively, not getting broken down. Um, and I think even, <clears throat> even from a... Um, a racing point of view, it's not even pure speed. Is it? It's efficiency, right? You're not burning the energy in your in your foot and lower leg muscles to run at that pace, or even to run a marathon um, than you were in the previous shoes. If, if you look, if you took like I say a 2005 era shoe that might have been just a lightweight EVA shoe, and you had somebody run either 205 marathon pace um, or or three hour marathon pace, it doesn't really matter. Um, in, in two different shoes the person running in the older EVA shoes would be efforting a lot harder, be wasting or using a lot more energy and also be much more broken down by say mile 18, 19, 20, 22 when, when they still have to run. And so I think that it, it's, it's changed the game entirely uh, for all those reasons. Um, and, you know, unfortunately um, or fortunately that's progress, I guess. Right. And, and it, 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 it's, it's not even possible to compare a marathon time from let's say 20, 10 to right now, you know, it's, it's apples to oranges, you know, and like all the great records through history probably have that same thing because, you know, a, a 210 marathon in 1970 versus a 210 marathon now are totally different. Right. Um, but again, that's progress too, because we've, we've seen every single sport evolve with their equipment um, with the exception of maybe, maybe baseball. All like, I guess they have different bats now too, uh, wooden bats, but I mean like most sports have evolved from, a wooden tech tennis racket to a carbon fiber or graphite tennis racket or, 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 you know, heavy wooden skis to lighter fiberglass, you know, the, every sport has evolved and the benefits come out in performance. So why do you think that this has been such a sticking point? Because it feels like even with that, that transition from the sixties, right? Like you said, like running, running that sixties, seventies, if you ran that two Oh five marathon or two Oh nine, two Oh eight, and today's, you know, 204, 205, um, you know, it feels like there has been a sticking point here. You know, there's been a lot of people on the internet for better or for worse saying, feels like some of these records should have an asterisk next to them. Because, you know, when we saw the, you know, a shoe like an alpha fly, which I don't have actually, but it's, it's, it is the maximalist carbon shoe if there, if there was one. And it's like, is that, is that mechanical doping, right? I'll use that word to it. Is that, um, you know, is that a shoe? Is that a design? Is that a tool? Um, you know, that originally it wasn't available to everybody. There became, you know, some stipulations and changes that now shoes have to be basically commercially available to the general public for them to be, I don't want to say record eligible because it's a gray area, but to basically be to race in them, they need to be publicly available, at least in some way. And this actually harkens back for anybody that's a true nerd here. Um, Audi, originally, when they were talking back with World Rally uh, WRC stipulations, they had to actually create cars that were commercially available to race because Audi had such an advantage when they were racing World Rally that they were stomping Peugeot and all these other crazy things. And so WRC came back and said, you have to have a car that's commercially available. And they said, what does commercially available mean? Right. They said, you have to have 119 cars or something available to the public. Well, guess how many they created? 120, right? And so they figured out a way to become commercially available um, and really kind of work around this. And I think, I think Nike in this sense is like, all right, what's our, what is our way around this so that we can still put the records down? And I look at it now and we're starting to see that. Nike or Saucony or Puma or all these other new carbon shoes. Everybody's got their carbon shoe now because just like the minimalist movement, when you said ASICs was kind of there is, are they behind, you know, who's behind now? Like we just saw a company like on put out, um, both their huge maximalist shoe with the cloud monster as well as, yep. That is, I mean, look at that thing. It is, it is the Bondi of today. It is, I mean, wow. But it's cool. it is just it's but, but to that it's, point, cool. it's a cool shoe that rides well. That if you put this out in 2010, you know when Hoka first put out their shoes, it wouldn't be viable. But because they did it in their own way with you know lighter materials and smart technology, that it works. You know, so it's but it, but it's, yeah, it's the evolution for sure. And so, why do you feel like there is such a sticking point 
around from everything from the four percent to the alpha fly. Yeah, so so it's kind of rooted in the industry um, and the competitiveness that that um, Nike felt with Adidas early on, like in the early seventies, and that was kind of stayed with those two brands um, as the leaders uh, for the longest time. And then you know Reebok came into play and in for a while in the in the eighties, but like really Adidas and Nike had the biggest stake in the game throughout that course of time, especially especially in the marathon game, right? And so. Um, you know, for a while, uh, you know, Nike had owned, you know, the world record in the marathons, but then all of a sudden Adidas came on strong and like, you know, it, it had little to do with the shoes initially, but it had a lot to do with the athletes they sponsor. Right. And so, you know, at some point, uh, you know, they were super competitive, but then, you know, um, Adidas, you know, most recently Adidas came up with this boost foam. They put it in the, the Adi zero shoe you talked about, um, the Adi zero adios. And then, uh, there was a couple of, uh, Fast world record set by the men's side um, uh, in, in like 2013, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you know, Adi, Adidas, Adi had this um, world record again, and so Nike went fast and furious into working into a new marathon shoe, and like people were talking about sub two, and like, and so kind of secretly and quietly, both of these brands are working on like you know how to revolutionize running and fast running and technology, and they they had all their you know lab people working on it and everything else, and so. When Nike first rolled theirs out, you know, and with, with the carbon fiber plate, they didn't tell anybody. Um, you know, the, the first time that I was aware that they were doing something, and I, and I kind of aware was aware something was happening, but wasn't sure, at the 2016 U.S. Olympic Trials Marathon in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was eventually, um, you know, it eventually came out. They had these, the, the first version of their Vaporfly shoes were there. And, you know, Galen Rupp wore them. Um, Amy Craig, Amy Hastings Craig, and then uh, Shalane wore them. Not every athlete wore them, but they were they were made to be identical to the uh, the other shoes they had out at the time, which was uh, Zoom Fly, I think. But um, so they looked identical, but the, but but certain athletes chose to or were given the chance to wear these other other shoes, and and certainly that's where people realized that okay, there's an advantage here, and the Nike athletes eventually used those in the uh, Rio Olympics too. So before it was really discussed what they were. They were using this technology that nobody knew about that wasn't sanctioned and not that any shoes were sanctioned in the past, but what everyone kind of realized was, okay, there's a lever in here and is that legal? Is that creating mechanical doping as they, as they called it, right? And so, you know, eventually the whole thing blew up and Nike kind of exposed what they had and then they did the chasing two, a breaking two thing where Kipchoge ran, initially ran two flat 25 or something like that in Monza, Italy. And this whole thing came out, but only Nike had this. Other brands had started to work on things. You know, Hoka had already actually had a kind of a prototype in play in 25, 15, 2016. And, but, but, but everyone kind of think, oh, Nike's just doing this. Nike's ripping everybody off. It's not fair. It's not a fair playing field. And that's, I think that's the biggest thing. And for me, it's the biggest thing. When you see a race, you want to know that it's a level playing field. And whatever training mm -hmm. and ability somebody brought to that race, uh, that's uh, equalized on the playing field of, the start line to the finish line, whether it's 100 meters or uh, 26 miles or whatever. And when Nike brought this out initially, everyone kind of like said, oh, well, you know, they're, they're cheating. They have an advantage. It's not a fair race. And to some extent, that was true. Now that we know the science behind it, that this new paradigm of putting a carbon fiber plate in these amazing foams. Yeah. I mean, the studies initially showed it was four to six percent uh, of an advantage. And that's crazy. I mean, like, you know, and that's why we've seen times uh, drop and all the previous conversation we had about uh, recovery and training were not yet known. All we knew was that, OK, there's faster race times. And, and from that alone, people freaked out. And absolutely so, you know, and every other brand started working on something, but they had to get a super advanced foam that Nike had already and understand really how the carbon fiber plate <clears throat> was going to interact with that foam and uh, what the shape of it was going to be. And so it took a while and as all this is happening, you know, you know, Nike's all of a sudden, you know, Nike shoes came out in 2017 to the, the public and right away they're on the podium of every race in the world. Right. All the all the big road races and all the big marathons. And so people were kind of upset that only Nike had this and only Nike athletes had that. So at um, the 2016 Olympics in Rio, the 2017 World Championships, um, there was a, dis a distinct advantage for Nike athletes and other brands that had great mm -hmm. marathoners couldn't wear those shoes because obviously it's a conflict of brand. But eventually <clears throat> other brands kind of fast track these programs. And by 2020, just before COVID hit, just before the Olympic trials marathon in Atlanta, 
World Athletics, the governing body of, of track and field and running, um, formerly the IAAF, but World Athletics came out with their decree and said, okay, we get, we've got to regulate this from the point of view of having an equal playing field because every brand is doing something different. And so essentially they, they created these parameters, which included, you know, uh, a couple of different things. One was uh, 40 millimeters of foam underfoot. And then also um, if there was one plate, kind of how it had to be. And if there was more than one plate, kind of how that had to be. And so that was put out there as the manifesto that every brand had to follow. And then to your point, you had to, you had to have this, um, there's, a, there's a shoe list. You can Google it. You can find out uh, if you Google like World Athletics um, Performance Shoes, you, you'll find this list that's current and you'll find every shoe on this list. And if you're a shoe geek, you can actually find out in advance kind of what's coming out because it's got to be on that list well in advance of a competition. So for the, the world championships this summer in Eugene, um, you're going to see some new shoes on marathoners that that uh, maybe are debuting right about now. I, I'm sure we'll see some at the Boston Marathon, which uh, at the time of this podcast is this weekend. But but you'll see them this spring. And so but but those, those shoes are already on that list. So if you Google that list at any given time, you'll see names of shoes that will likely appear later at competition. So. The beauty of that is it at least did some ability to equalize the, um, the, the, the design paradigm. Um, it doesn't really kind of come into play um, with foam. There's so many different foams that do different things, right? And so it still comes down to the expertise and the, and the, and the lab science of how the foam and, and the plate interact um, and how it's, how it's designed. But at least it's at least more understood up front. And there's, there's no surprises. Nobody's showing up at a race like they did in 2016 with uh with 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 surprise shoes you know so long story short was um and i think i said the date wrong but it was 2016 in in, in los angeles for the olympic trials and then the, the rio olympics where nike had a distinct advantage and so now you know i think i think that some of it that's settled down a little bit and i think people understand it is like now it's progress now it's modern progress and it's not maybe mechanical doping like they they said it was before well and i think one of the things that happened in there is that you know if if you were trying to win a race and you weren't in a pair of Nikes, right. like it wasn't going to happen. And so what we saw is we actually saw this also change, um, how sponsored athletes, you know, and contracts now it's like, well, you might have a contract with X running shoe company or running brand an ASICs or, you know, on, for example. And if they didn't have a carbon plated shoe, you actually started to see exceptions put into contracts. Or you would show up and you would see this shoe and you would know that it was this shoe, but it was blacked out. It was spray painted. It was, it was basically debranded so that athletes were basically, that was how they could dodge the, their contract and move into a space where, oh, okay, I can actually compete now because without these, I can't compete, right? I'm, it's not a factor of coaching or uh, aerobic ability. It's, I'm going to be left behind if I don't have this key piece of material and tool. So the last thing I wanted to talk about here, because I know we're, we're getting close to an hour and I really appreciate uh, having you on today, is I want to talk about the future here because I've seen a couple really cool things that have recently kind of cropped up. Two things I wanted to talk about is one, Killian Jornet and his, his move away from Solomon, which I think is a really exciting thing. And then I think the second thing I wanted to talk through here is we're starting to see, at least in, with one brand, a shift into a different way to buy shoes and look at true shoes. And this is a company out of Austin, a tray you, um, and they've taken a different look at how shoes are sold, how shoes are acquired and marketed and branded. And, um, I really love to kind of see your take on what's the future hold. You had mentioned that there's going to be some new shoes. I just saw as we were getting ready for this podcast, uh, because I'm on protos of the gram as everybody probably is. Puma's got some really crazy looking new super shoe coming out. Maybe there's an alpha fly two. Um, you know, what, what is on the forefront and what are you excited about? Yeah. And I mean, as we're sitting here, I've got, I've got, um, this is a uh, socket knee endorphin speed three, which, um, you know, to this point in, in the realm of things, it's, it, it comes out like right about now, but it's not even new because what, what, what I consider new is like, what's next. Right. And so it's an ex right. <laughs> exciting time of the year because, in the springtime, these new shoes come out, and we're a little bit late now because of the supply chain problems with uh, the COVID-related shipping problems. But typically by Boston, which you know mid-April, shoes are already out. But now they're just coming out, so it is an exciting time. And to get an updated version of one of the shoes in the in the past couple of years, you know, like I said, this is the Endorphin Speed, which has a a, a, um, a nylon plate, not a not, not a um, 
carbon plate. Uh, this is the new Ultra uh, Carbon Vanish or Vet Vanish Carbon, which is their first version of a carbon plated shoe in an ultra way. Um, you know, I, I showed you the, um, the Cloud Monster before from On. I think I think it's an exciting time, you know, right now. So April of 2022, where all these new shoes are coming out. And it's, it's kind of a lot of updates and new things. And then, you know, we're also seeing, you know, kind of a hint of things like the next racing shoes. And racing is where all the technology goes and it eventually trickles down into, into everyday trainers, which is great. And so, yeah, certainly I think we're going to see a continued evolution of, of foam products. Um, and we are, we've already seen it in the last few years going to, to running spikes. And so we've seen faster times in, in, in track and field because of that. So obviously foams and plates, uh, the technology works, right? And now we're seeing athletes training better and differently and racing differently because of it. And so I think that'll all continue to evolve. I think that um, from year to year, there's subtle differences with, um, you know, some of the upper material, some of the, the, the finer details, which is great. But I think, I think also the shape of shoes is, is starting to become a little bit crazy. I mean, like certainly the Puma shoes, if you've seen the Hoka 10-9 shoes, which are these crazy extended shoes, um, for, for an example, I have a pair of, of 10 nines that I'm a 10 and a half and everything, and they're, they're longer and bigger than a size 14. And how does that make sense? Uh, from a practical point of view, I'm not sure it does with that initial version, but it, it shows that, that brands, shoe brands are really kind of thinking outside the box and trying to think about, you know, just, just dismantling the whole idea of what a running shoe was. Just as, you know, just as happened in, in the last 20 years, we talked about that's how we got to minimalism, right? And just thinking completely outside the box. And so the new Puma shoe, uh, some Hoka shoes are just have these crazy designs, very arky, long designs. But again, if, 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 we're, if we're taking cues to some of the new science, to some of the new performance metrics, um, there are ways that brands are really looking at uh, kind of these um, just mind blowing like concepts that like, wow, that's a running shoe, right? And I think that you know, if you were teleported from 1995 to now, you wouldn't believe anything, right? Marathon times right. or shoes, anything. But I think that's what's cool. And I think that um, you know, every brand has like their their kind of um, their shoe team that does year over year improvements on on whatever's there. Because we can always improve a shoe a little bit with with new things and new colors and everything else. But they also have a, an advanced concepts team that is really working down the road, you know, and like. Um, experimenting with foams that, that haven't really been understood in like, in, you know, um, a shoe platform yet um, to, to bring stuff in and, and try it out and then make prototypes and then be able to put them in a lab and say, oh, wow, this, this gave us, uh, you know, a much different result. So I think <clears throat> that's where the excitement lies. I don't think this is going to slow down anytime soon. I mean, if you look at mm -mm. everything else in our world, um, especially like the things we use all the time, like, like, like cell phones or even like um, performance apparel or, um, or, or our cars, you know, even the dashboard of your car, look at how it's changed and evolved and how much interaction it has. So all that stuff that happens in pop culture in everyday life is going to continue to happen in running shoes because running shoes are such a hot market. I mean, like right now we have more people running than ever before. Post COVID uh, has even um, spiked this industry even higher. Um, we'll soon see, you know, greater participation, participation, participation numbers in races um, that we had a lull for a while, but it'll be back. And then um, all these new runners that are coming into it. So all these things, it's a perfect storm um, of, of technology, of innovation, of demand, of, of, um, of, of even changes in materials. I mean, if you, you know, a lot of these um, new foams and materials are made um, in, uh, in East Asia and like the, the demand to find new stuff is pushing that industry as well. So the supply chain for every little thing you, you get um, into a shoe is, is changing rapidly. And so it's a super exciting time. I mean, I think we'll see, you know, aside from foams, we'll see some kind of quasi liquid kind of materials that are in shoes. I mean, all this weird stuff that you like, what? But I mean, I, you know, I hear inklings from, from brands all the time and certainly that stuff comes to life, you know? And if you look at even what Speedland has been doing, Speedland is a cool company couple guys that used to work at Nike and uh, Under Armour, and they decided, okay, look, we know how we need to build a shoe commercially to go to market. But we also know the best materials that are out there and the coolest things we could put on a shoe. And if no price is involved, let's put, you know, a, a really cool Carbotex uh, uh, um, uh, plate in there. Let's, 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 put Bo, let's put Boa on there. And like, you know, they've really worked hard to just, you know, maybe they're only making 1,400 pairs a year. But there, that's another example of pushing the envelope for the sake of innovation. And like, 
Um, all those things combined, I mean, I think it's a super exciting future in terms of what's next. I think that, you know, as soon as this year, we're going to see some really cool shoes. And then in the next two to five years, we're just going to be blown away. It'll be crazy. Yeah, I think one of the things, and I'd be remiss to not ask you is, you know, do we think that that carbon fiber plate technology, I know we've seen it in a few trail shoes already, but do we think that that's going to have a mainstay? I, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because I don't know if it'll be a mainstay from you got to have it like you do have to have it for a marathon. If you want to run a fast marathon, you absolutely have to have it. In trail running, I think there's so many more factors that go into it. If Whether you're running a, a, a five, 5K run in your lunch break or running a 100 miler, there's so many other factors on trail weather and uh, altitude and type of terrain and, you know, whether you're fueled or not, uh, that I'm not sure it's going to make a difference for everybody that has to have them. But I think that carbon fiber might play a role in more things than just a plate under, underfoot. It could be, you know, partially plate and foam, but it also could be aspects of like a wearable, like a, like almost like a fabric of, of, of carbon fiber. And we've seen that, you know, Carbotex is a brand that has mm-hmm. done a lot of great things like that. There's several other companies out there that are really experimenting with like, you know, what we used to think of as a nylon jacket that could be a very breathable, pliable carbon fiber jacket, right? So things that we can only imagine now are going to happen. And I think that that'll be more of a, a way to get the combination of comfort, support, um, durability, and protection in a trail shoe um, from some of these newfangled ways of using carbon fiber. So again, I don't, I, we've seen a couple of shoes come out already with, with modest results of, of foam and plate for running, but I think that's just the start of what we'll see in trail running. Yeah, hundred percent agree. I mean, we could probably get into the crazy world of carbon technology and carbon nanotubes, but I think we'll have to save that mm-hmm. for another day on into the future. Um, I did want you to have a chance to, you know, you've you've done everything from start, you know, original editor at Trail Runner Magazine. You've got a great book in Kixology, which kind of takes our conversation today to a completely different level. Um, I wanted you to have a chance to share both where you can be found and what's coming up next for you. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, if you go to my own website, brianmetzler.com, you can find um, everything I've done with um, a lot of publishing and then also my books. Uh, I also published a book recently with a friend of mine, Doug Mayer from Chamonix, France on trail running. It's called Trail Running Illustrated, which is kind of a new take on kind of um, the way to, to kind of inspire people about trail running. <clears throat> so that's been uh, there. I've been definitely working uh, with a lot of media right now to create content and um, actually some a couple of races as well. And so uh, I've got my, my hand in a lot of different uh, kind of pots, so to speak, but that's kind of by design. I definitely like to, to be involved with um, a lot of aspects of the industry. And so I have some consulting gigs with footwear companies and, um, you know, with I, I work with some retail brands and everything else. So for me, it's kind of, all, it's purposely all over the place right now, which is good. And it uh, definitely gives me an insight to kind of what, what's coming next. Um, uh, I'm always kind of like, you know, I think I think I'm a mix of the classic running shoe geek, the longtime runner. I'm still running. I'm I'm uh, I'm training for a couple of trail runs this summer, um, trail races this summer, and then also like the the journalistic nose of me. I know journalism and media have changed quite a bit, but I think that um, what my long long kind of history in journalism brings me is like how to understand what a story idea, what what's new, what's different, and so the ability to create content in any medium at this point, whether it's um, you know, whether it's written, whether it's video, whether it's social media is how unique it is and how, how kind of, um, you know, eye catching it is. And so I think that that's, you know, that combination of all those things is what has put me where I am right now. And it's, for me, it's an exciting time to be in an industry I still love. Right. And I think that like, there's so many different ways that running is evolving, running shoes are evolving. I mean, trails and ultras and like, whatever your passion is, whatever you want to do. I mean, there's, there's, there's fun ways to, uh, to kind of explore that. So, yeah, if you go to my website, you can uh, see where my, my books are available and then also just catch up on what I'm doing. Brian, I really appreciate you taking the time today. I know we could probably sit down and talk more shoe stuff, but uh, I think uh, I'll have to have you on again in the future so we can talk through some of this new crazy technology that uh, if you guys are looking for some cool places to check out one, check out Brian. Uh, he's on Instagram as well as if you are kind of a shoe nerd, I really, really like protos of the gram. There's a couple of other ones that are kind of spinoffs of that, but that tends to be the place that if you're looking for something cool to see, you're like, Oh, I wonder what's coming up next. Uh, that's, that's the place uh, that, that tends to get it out first. You're, we're talking about seeing the uh, unbranded kind of, uh, you know, camoed models out there. So uh, with that said, we will catch up with you guys in a week. See you guys.